Congratulations, you've all made it through the most intensive and most awesome part of Capstone, and you're now ready to dive in and create your poster. So I've created this Prezi to show you both the layout of the poster and to communicate the importance of each of the sections. We'll, we'll move from here in a later session to looking at the visual literacy of your poster. So for now, I want to talk about posters as a form of communication. And they are epically awesome um, in communicating a lot of information in a really short period of time. Posters balance about 50% visual with about 50% text, or sometimes even less text than visual. So overarchingly, posters communicate exceedingly well, and they do that in a short period of time. Oftentimes, the visitors to your poster will spend only about one to 10 minutes. And it could be that a piece of that 10 minutes is spent in conversation rather than in you presenting the poster or them reading the poster. So it's really important to use really straightforward, straightforward language, short sentences. And in fact, it's OK in posters not to use complete sentences. You can actually have bullets the way that I'm using bullets here um, if those communicate succinctly and well. So you want to always, and this is true in all communication, remember funnel focus and unify, always maintaining your focus on the central message, having coherency is really important. But one thing that's very different than the kind of funnel focus and unify that we did in the proposal is that now we're, we're chunking and we're using small digestible bites of text. So you remember reading Diane Matthews' article, and she talks about chunking so that the text is in these um, bite-sized pieces and easy for your reader to consume. Sometimes, again, that may mean that you're using lists, or you're using flowcharts, or you're using visual. All of those things can be really, really effective when it comes to a poster. Of course, the more creative you can be, the more your audience is going to be pulled into your particular poster. So we know that posters can stand alone, like if you left them in the STEM foyer even after we left, they would be able to be appreciated and read. Um, we want to make sure that they are communicating the most important central messages. So we want to ask ourselves, Selves, what does the audience need to know? What are the, the take-homes that we want them to go away with? Um, one of the things that I struggle with the most is that I have this tendency to want to literally brain dump everything I know onto a single poster. And unfortunately, that is not effective. So we need to choose. We need to be selective. We need to say, this belongs, this doesn't. So that central message. Um, so we will be using the I am rad formula. That is, we'll have an introduction, we'll have materials and methods, we'll have results and we'll have discussion. We'll also have a conclusion and acknowledgement. But if it helps you to remember the I am rad, you know, that is a good way to remember the central elements of our poster. Let's take a moment to zoom into the title. We already know a lot about titles. For your proposals, you wrote your titles. You did a, a great job of writing succinct summarizing statements that said what it was that you were going to do. You were, plan you were communicating your plan, so your design methodology and your content was there. But there's going to be a big change in the poster title, and that is that you're going to somehow try to indicate your findings. So rather than just saying what you're proposing to do, you're saying what you did and what you found. Of course, avoiding jargon is a good idea, but if you can have something that's engaging and pulls people in, that's also a great idea. We've got a couple of practice titles to consume and look at here. Um, the first one, Specificity and Sensitivity of Fecal bacter Bacteroides, um, Human-Specific Primers with, with Fecal and Wastewater Samples from the U.S. Midwest and Northeast Regions. There's some cool things about this title, like it does contextualize, so you know that it's in the U.S. Midwest and Northeast Regions. Um, we know we're working with fecal wastewater samples, which we're familiar with, right? Um, and we know there's something about using primers, but it's interesting that this doesn't have an active verb, so we're actually a little bit uncertain what they're doing with these primers. We think that they maybe are measuring specificity and sensitivity, um, you know, maybe determining that, but it might help to have an active verb. And I tend to suggest active titles, so 
you know, measuring specificity and sensitivity of fecal, fecal bacteroides, human specific primers, that might add to that. Um, we could probably argue about whether just being about fecal and wastewater samples makes this engaging. Maybe it does. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but there could maybe be some other things that would make it more engaging. Let's just read the next one, and I'll leave it to you to think about assessing this one. Biomedicine application of staph phages as a bio nanostructure particles as Oh, that's a typo, isn't it? For MRSA or MRSA, diabetic foot infections, wounds, burns, and abscesses, abscess cases. So that's kind of got some, um, you could tell I kind of stumbled over it a little bit. So we could assess that one. And you let me know what you think. Let's look at the introduction. But before I zoom into that, let me just make a quick note that part of your work is already done. You've already written your objectives, hypotheses, and specific aims. So you don't need to worry about um, rewriting those. But one thing you will need to think about is you may have set out to test more hypotheses than you were able to. And with that being the case, you're going to need to taper down what you communicate as your hypotheses and, and of course, your aims for this. So it's probably likely that your broad objectives are still the same. So there's not a ton of work to be done here, but be thoughtful about just copying and pasting from your, your prior work. So let's take a look at our introduction. Remember here that we want to um, bring in the pivotal literature, but more important than anything is that significance and problem statement. So I kind of think about this you know, it, by analogy to Harry Potter and, and Quidditch. And if you think about the golden snitch as being like, without it, there is no game, right? There's all these bludgers and beaters and all these people doing all these things. But if there wasn't a golden snitch, there would be no game. And I think about the significance and problem statement as being that golden snitch. I mean, it's what we need to always revolve all of what we do around. So don't lose sight of it. Don't lose track of it. Um, and of course, you did this in your proposals, but one big difference is that now you need to think about being succinct. You need to be, you need to think about shortening to bullet points potentially and using much less in the way of wordiness to describe your, your introduction. So please make sure that your audience, by the time they've read this, they know why it was that you set out to do the research that you did, why this was something that was important. And we can easily communicate that. We just need to think about how to do it in a few less words. In the introduction, you might find it beneficial to give small subsection headings. It's, it's possible that you want to actually give these overview of pivotal literature subsection headings, if that's helpful in allowing your reader to, to feel organized. Um, so don't lose track of the condensation and, and chunking that is, is pivotal to a good poster. Hi, everyone. You're just now getting to meet my cat, Cal, um, and he's helping with um, the poster vodcast. So we've now zoomed out and looking at our overall flow of the poster. And I'm going to take just a moment to call your attention to the fact that we see in this um, somewhat boring poster layout, but nonetheless, one that communicates the flow in terms of having this vertical alignment. You can see there are three columns. Each one of the columns columns is aligned. So you don't see, say, one box over here and then a box over here and then a box over here. So you want to choose either a vertical or a horizontal flow. And another thing that's really important about any good poster is that the golden rectangle is this center area here. And it's in the center really um, high vis area that you want to put the things that you most want your viewers to see, aka the important data. <laughs> Additionally, it could be that you want to showcase your methods. So these, this golden rectangle area is a good place for those really important take home messages. So let's take a moment to zoom into what we might want to accomplish in the methods section. We know what that needs to communicate. We know that it needs to tell about what we did. And we certainly know that all of a sudden your lab notebook takes on a whole new value. If you did a good job of writing a story in your lab notebook, you probably also can do a great job of distilling that story down to a succinct 
set of visuals or bullet points. So in fact, methods can be really, really well done in a visual way. And I actually want to show you one of the um, final posters from one of my capstone teams in 2014. And they actually were studying uh, compost and looking at the uh, olfactory uh, problems with compost. And so they um, had on site at Acres, they set this uh, up where they had an aeration pipe in the compost and they either covered or didn't cover and then they were sampling weekly. Every Sunday they would go out and sample and bring it back into the lab to um, serve their, their week's worth of work. And you can actually see what they did. Oh, you can see their dilution scheme. You can see the types of media that they then played it on and what the colony count and the fact they took pH and nitrate and ammonia um, readings. And so this communicates a lot without having to use words really at all. So this may be a particularly effective thing to do in your methods section. You can also use flow charts. Some of you have already made some beautiful flow charts. Um, our analogists have done that. So we can also note that our um, clay for days is going to want to clearly describe novel methods because they were doing this brand new made up method for plasticity. They were dropping from a, you know, a meter up and looking at how much it, it changed in terms of due to indent, um, how much the height changed. So th th that was a novel method. You're going to want to clearly describe that. We do need to communicate something about context. So for example, for our resistance, you all need to think about communicating all of the seven different counties from which you received samples. It's important that we're talking about the sites and, and what was cultured and even our statistical methods, right? We, we need to think about those as well. So I know I saw Clay for Days doing their statistics in Jump the other day. And so you're going to want to actually say that. You need to tell your readers how you perform those statistics. So there's a lot to be done in methods, but the more visual you, the more of a visual way you can use, the more you can communicate in a short period of time and in an effective way. Remember to always keep your eye on those central axioms of funnel, focus, and unify. And whether we're talking about methods or whether we're talking about um, results, this is always the name of the game. So the heart of your poster is your results. Your results are the most important piece and don't let your failures make you think differently. Sometimes when teams don't achieve exactly what they set out to do, they somehow think that they don't have anything to present. That is false. <laughs> so if you find yourself thinking, well, we really didn't find anything, you're wrong. <laughs> so go back, go back to the drawing board and say, what did we find? And how do we communicate that in a visual way and in a way that we're making the point? Um, it, it makes me think of this 60s movie that I once saw called The Point. Um, so it's like, well, what is the point? Well, we need to think about what that point is. What do we want people to go away with? And how can we visually do it? So if we can think about using tables or illustrations, um, photography sometimes is a way that we can communicate our results and really focus on clarity. We don't want a bar graph with 17,000 different bars on it. Um, likewise, a pie chart that looks like you can't even read the slices of the pie. Um, so we want to have some clear message. I want to show you one of the um, poster, one of the other posters that was done by our fun guys some time ago. And I think this does a beautiful job of clear communication in the results where you can see they have only two colors of columns here. You can tell that this is when they saw the mycelia begin, you know, when they first saw the mycelia, you can see that the day at which that occurred and you can see the growth container in which it occurred. And likewise, when the first primordia were um, were there. So you can see that that was um, more um, lengthy. It took longer to see that in container six than it did in container four. Likewise, over here, they were looking at the amount of uh, Pseudomonas putida in their different 
um, substrates. So they either had the um, non-autoclave versus, or this is the autoclave, the blue versus the non-autoclave. And it's not surprising to see more Pseudomonas putita in the non-autoclave. But what was really interesting about their results was that, and let me just scan down here, was that they found a really demonstrable, very statistically significant difference in the um, the biomass that they collected from their uh, autoclave substrates versus their non-autoclave substrates, which is really interesting. I'll also call your attention to the captions. The captions need to be succinct and they need to clearly communicate what we're seeing. So notice this, autoclave substrates produce 26 times the, fung the fungal dry weight of the non-autoclave substrates. Boom, take home message, Bingo, right there, one sentence, very, very clear. So this was a nice, a nice example of uh, communicating some very clear results. So don't allow your medium to interfere with your message. And one of the things that happens sometimes with that is that we get taken with these crazy kinds of graphs or these really cool ways that we can show things. But then if the medium is what you're focused on and not the message, then we need to go back to the drawing board. Um, so important to make sure that the message is what is um, dictating the medium and not the other way around. So now that we have looked at the golden rectangle and we really understand what we're going to feature in that region, let's differentiate the results from the discussion and there is a huge difference. However, sometimes that difference gets missed. Often time in the discussion, we'll see a regurgitation of the results. For example, a statement like, you know, we saw that there was greater biomass in the autoclave substrate. Well, that was already stated. You don't need to say it again. What you might say is you might say something like, the um, increased biomass in the autoclave substrates could potentially indicate that without the competitive um, environment of the non-autoclave substrate, the fungal biomass was able to be more uh, robust, right? You're making an interpretation, and that's the difference in a discussion. You're assessing, you're interpreting, you're putting forward your opinion, uh, often based in the literature. Uh, so you might say this, so after that statement that I just said, um, it might be due to the competitive impacts of the non-autoclaved substrate. This would be in agreement with Zhao et al., you know, and you would cite something that supported that conclusion. So wrap back around to the literature, make con connections back to the introduction. And I like to think of a good poster as being like an hourglass because you start with that funneling at the broad point of, of establishing broad interest and couching in the literature. You come down to your specific study, your hypotheses, and then your results and all that you did at that micro level. And then you come back out and you say, what does it mean for all of this? How does it tie back into the literature? How can we connect it to the big picture significance, right? That golden snitch, always connecting back to that golden snitch. And, and for us specifically, like how, how has what we found, how is it going to affect programs, policies? How is it going to affect our community? How does it affect our stakeholders? How does it affect Dave? How does it affect, um, you know, his grape grower? What what are we able to tell them, if anything at all? Um, or I bet there's something, right? I bet there's something that we can tell them. Um, so the organizations for whom the research was done and also our limitations. And in fact, write that in right here. Limitations, very important. Because we may be um, making some conclusions based upon um, not enough trials. Maybe we need to express that we were only able to do this one, one trial and that may be a huge limitation um, that we need to go back and we need to redo it again. So, etc. Okay. So the discussion, very, very different from the results. In the conclusion, just state the overarching outcomes. This might be two bullets. Maybe there are two big take-home messages that follow from the data. And then say, future, here's what we need to get done. We know for each and every one of your projects, there's something that we could do in the future. <laughs> we had to stop before we really wanted to. So we want to make sure that those that's stated and that we say, we hope that this research will go on and here's what might be done in the future. 
we want to make sure you can find that section. A lot of times people skip to the conclusion. I've even read some resources that say maybe you want to start with the conclusions. I don't really like that, but it's, it, it, it does state the importance of it um, in that way. So yeah, and acknowledgements. We have a lot of them because although this year um, the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources and specifically the microbiology program is our funding source, we also need to thank some others. For example, enologist, you need to thank Jerry Andrews profusely because he's provided a lot. You, we, we need to, to thank our community partners as well. Um, we maybe need to thank anybody who let us use our equipment. We need to, uh, Clay for days, you need to, to thank uh, the Bisha Lab. Uh, we need to, we might all want to thank um, uh Holly in this section. In fact, I, I suggest we do, and we probably want to thank John in this section as well. Um, and that makes me realize that always thinking is better, but one person who you don't think is me. <laughs> um, in this particular case, I am an author. So when you put the authors here, um, that is the one thing your PI always is. And, you know, it's funny, I've heard some grad students say things like, well, my PI, I have to put his name on there or her name on there, even though that person doesn't do anything. Your PI is always doing something. <laughs> I promise the opportunity to do what you do would not be there without that person, even if it's maybe not over to you. So that helps us um, with the overarching sections of our poster. And um, I'll I'll make one more note, and that is that we will be citing references. And just for practice, because some of you are going into healthcare fields, I've suggested that we use the Vancouver style for references, uh, largely because this uh, particular style, if you do do um, any kind of professional school for the posters used there, they'll want you to use Vancouver. So let's practice with Vancouver and, and get used to. It's a little different than others. Um, so you can find the guide for that at this uh, link. And in fact, I've got some extra hard copies too. Let me know if you would like one of those. Yay, thank you. And have a wonderful, wonderful day um, where, and time wherever it is for you when you decide to watch this.